I'm Joan Collier. I'm going to walk around because I'm not a teacher, but I feel like the whole room needs some love. I'm Senior Director of the Division for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement, which is what we call DICE. Um, and so my job is to work on strategic initiatives and um, diversity uh, education. And I'm really happy to be here because my colleagues and workers, Global and I, have a lot in common. Uh, we love the students get to go out, make new experiences, see what's going on out in the world. And one of the conversations that comes up is our students go abroad. Um, they learn a lot about their sort of pieces. And there's other things that they learn. And sometimes they have to tassel and tussle with concepts while they're out in the world. And we don't want them to be caught off guard by that. And I was like, that's a really great example. So I'll give a couple of pieces about myself. Um, and then I'm going to share a little bit. And then we can talk. Like, we, you can ask me questions. We can chat. Um, and we can do all those sorts of things. And because I'm going to unmask up front, I'm going to step away from all of y'all. I don't have um, any germs. I have 13-week-old God babies. So I am always masked. So. Uh, don't tell their mama, she's a virologist who studies COVID. Um, <laughs> and she would probably box me in my throat. So like I said, my study abroad experience was foundational. I'm a first generation um, student. I grew up in the great city of um, Atlanta, Georgia. And I went to Georgia State uh, University. Um, I studied um, human resource development. Business was cute, but I was like, where are the people? Where are the people? Um, and so, I wound up being a part of a group of folks who studies higher education. So you're all in school, woo woo, oh, good for y'all. I study how you learn. My job is to understand how students make sense of the world around them, the ecosystems that make up the institutions. And so I then went to South Africa via my dean's office as our study abroad. We tricked them and they sent me and my best friend. Now me and Bestie are both in this industry, but they didn't need to know that. And so um, one of the things that happens sometimes is we send people off. Now, I'm going to date myself. I don't care if y'all think I'm old. There's an alternative to getting older, and it's called dying, and I'm still alive. I'm 38. So I said, OK, hello. Um, so I studied abroad in 2007. We went to South Africa. In 2007, whew, that was a minute ago, when we left, we're both black Americans. Awareness of who you are is interesting. And what we're talking about is like, how do we go abroad and not be the stereotypical American? I'm not going to hold you. There are some ideas around who we are when we show up. Right? Even if you're not American, but you're from here, they're like, oh, here they come. They finna come in here loud and wrong. And sometimes we are loud and wrong. I'm not going to lie. So, <laughs> so we want to be thoughtful. And we are thoughtful here, and sometimes it doesn't translate. So I'm telling you, I'm first gen was a low-income student. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm descendant of enslaved Africans, so I trace my ancestry on this country through enslaved people from the west coast of Africa. Okay, And they say, you're going to South Africa. And I'm like, baby, I'm going home. South Africa is not the west coast of Africa. Hello. But nobody thought to tell me that, even though I could read a map. And so I get myself on this plane for 17 hours. And none of my faculty, none of the grown-ups had prepped us to think about what it means to be somewhere else. And so for context, in this country, I am always black. Black is always first. I'm a woman, I'm black. At that time, I knew I was straight. I didn't name it because that's the norm, right? I had no concept of trans and cis, so I couldn't say I was a cisgender woman. I didn't recognize ability because I didn't have any mobility issues. Class was a thing because I knew I didn't have a lot of money, but they paid for me to go so I could ask everybody in my family for $20, and I would have a little bit of change when I got there. And then you go to a new place, and people ask you in 2007, why is your country at war? And you're like, excuse me? Um, <laughs> we were in the, um, I think we were over, we were in a lot of places, but we had come out of the post 9-11 round. 9-11 happened my senior year of high school. We were still embroiled. And so for people to ask me, what does it mean for my country? And I'm like, I don't know what it means for my country. Right? Is that an answer? Sure. Is it a thoughtful one? Probably not. Right? So what does it mean for me to be in this new country, excited about what I get to learn about higher education in South Africa, somehow missing the colonized piece of it? So I'm learning about colonized higher education 
in on a campus where there are communities who are the direct indigenous people of that land whose higher education or educational practices are not recognized by the institution, right? How am I learning from that? There was no consensus around I should be thinking about that. I actually didn't even think about the people of that land being indigenous to that land in the way that I would think of the Lenape people as indigenous to this land. So I get there, I'm having a good time, and I'm like, can we meet black people? And they said, sure, you can meet black people. So I go, and we was like, girl, child, we finna meet our like cousin, right? We call everybody cousin. We finna meet our cousin. And they bring us a woman who is Indian, from India. And that's when I realized race is a different construct in a different country. And then someone called me colored. In this country, you call me colored, we might have an Oscars moment, right? We ain't been colored since like 1965. Don't do that, right? But that language meant something race-wise in another country. I go, I'm learning, and I'm like, this is interesting. I was far more judgmental. I'm good and grown now, I pay all my bills. At, not, at 20, I had a lot of ideas. And I'm not saying don't have them, I'm saying journal them. I'm saying you can be uncomfortable and write it down. I'm saying you don't have to say it back out loud. Don't be me when you travel, right? Um, and so I was like, oh, this is really interesting um, around race. And I was like, well, I miss somebody like black, black. And they said, well, black here is all of this. And I said, well, somebody like African, like African. They were like, well, this is like African. And I was like, somebody who would have been my ancestry, like in my ancestral line. So then I met a woman who was uh, Osa, I think is how you say it, uh, Zimkita. She became my new BFF there. And we talked about the difference, and I could catch her up on days of our lives, because they were four seasons behind. Um, and I was fascinated by her being behind on Law and Order, but she was up to date. And so music was different. And then I learned about gender being fascinating in other places, right? There were people who, when I met them, I had to shake their hand last. Um, because I was a woman, right? And so I was like, oh, that's, that's interesting. I didn't call it interesting then, I called it as misogynistic and patriarchal. And I'm not saying it's not those things, but it is what it is. I'm in that place. I'm learning through tradition. What does that mean? So I journaled and rolled and talked a lot of cash money with my best friend who was a six, seven black man from Savannah, Georgia. And traveling with my best friend was a blessing because we could process, but it was also interesting because we could talk across gender lines and some other things, whatever else. And so class becomes something different, right? In this country, I'm middle class because right now I have a PhD, I got a good grown up job, I can pay all my bills, I got all these other things, and I understand wealth looks different across the world. And again, what I offer you to do is to turn to wonder. How might this be? Why might this be? What historically has gotten us to this place and the question that I had to really sit with when I got back to America, because while I was there, I was just taking it all in, is how do people understand me as an American? And I'm having to answer these questions I've never had to answer before. And I'm not going to lie to you, processing what it meant to be American was jarring for me. Because my relationship to my own country has not always been easy. Um, and so trying to account for, right, reckon with, the tensions of being American and not always feeling fully American, my ancestral elder sort of presence, like what does that mean? And I am actually American, and I bet that means something when I go places. So I come back to the States, and we're talking to the grown-ups who are like, how'd you like it? Was it great? And I was like, yeah, because their drinking age looked different, so they gave us wine for breakfast. Um, and I'm someone who doesn't drink, so I was weird for not drinking. Um, and I was like, why would you make me drink? I don't like wine. It's the driest wine. Blech. And so you, you learn things about yourself. What I offer that part to say is, ask yourself, what does the place have to teach you? I think y'all are going with like your academic departments or something with like the school is sending you or y'all decide to go. So yes, go learn about the economics. Yes, go learn about language. Yes, go learn about all the things that you're supposed to learn about. And I, I'm begging you, do not miss what you learn about yourself. Do not miss what you learn about yourself as an American in a non-American space, whether it be European or not. If you're traveling somewhere um, 
where, where, wherever it is that you're going, look up the politics of that place and understand the U.S.'s impact in that space without judgment. I'm not saying judge, I'm saying at least have an understanding of it, right? Understand it. I remember when Mandela got out of jail in South Africa. My grandmother pulled me back in the house. I was little, but I remember she pulled us back in the house, told us it was important, we needed to see it. And so I, I remember that, and I remember being in South Africa, and the school not wanting to be embarrassed, refusing to take us to the apartheid museum. And me saying to them, you know I'm a black American. And they said, oh, well, that doesn't matter. And I said, you understand South Africa wrote its apartheid codes after the United States um, Jim Crow and black codes. So whatever you did here is not that far-fetched from what happened to my people. It's more beneficial for me to learn than for you to hide it, right? And so inviting folks in the conversation and being clear when folks are just not ready and that's okay. And the being not being ready might be us. So fast forward, I go get my PhD, and I decide I'm going to Ghana. I've only ever traveled abroad um, to the African continent, so that's my other thing. Uh, I've never been to Europe or Asia. It's on my list, but not during the panorama. And so, <laughs> just I'm not, I'm not ready. So I switch up, and I go to Ghana, and now I'm a PhD student going to understand learning and education as a doctoral student with all my good training uh, in Accra and uh, Kumasi and all these other places. So I'm in my early 30s now. And uh, Cynthia Diller was our person. I'm looking at the time like I'm over here, got a watch on. I don't. Okay. I'm going to wrap y'all up in about five or six minutes and then we can chat. And what she said is, what does the place have to teach you about, well, what does the place that you're going have to teach you? Or what might it have to teach you? My job, I was studying um, the impact of uh, textured hair in space and place in uh, Ghana, because I was interested at the time. I had these really long locks. Um, I had been doing studies with black women in textured hair, natural hair on our campuses. It was just interesting what it looked like um, when I was in Ghana. And that sort of sh shifted over time. Once I got there, I changed my research. but. I was struck by having never thought about what Ghana might have to teach me outside of my studies, and I felt bad about that. And so what I'm inviting you to do is think about what it is. We traveled fall 2015. Fall 2015 was a year before the election of Donald Trump. The elections, uh, the campaigns had already started. So that was happening. The, I think Greece was going bankrupt. There was just a lot happening. So again, we travel, we traverse, um, and asking ourselves, what does it mean to go back to this place? The first go round, it was me and Bestie. This go round, there were, I think, 13 of us. We were all black American. We were all doctoral students and three black faculty members, tenure track or tenured. So we were going to travel and um, the intra diasporic, so across African people, up. Uh, Knowledge gaining was interesting. Um, I'm typically accustomed to having to orient to Eurocentric audiences. In that particular case, I was in a space uh, where most people were Ghanaian, and Ghanaian is a like it's a municipal space, but it's a colonized sort of thing, and there are people there, of course, but undoing some of the things I had learned across culture, right? So the first time I was excited just to see black people on the continent, now I'm in, now I'm clear that this is not me coming home, this is me coming back to a space where people continue to stay. And where they are welcoming us, maybe, and maybe not. And I get to tussle and hold the tension of why might people be concerned about these Americans coming back? Not that they don't like us, but they're like, what, what are your intentions here? What do you want? Are you gonna impress upon us some other things? What is it that you need us to know? And I thought of my colleague who, had to go back into the closet because rights in this country look a little different, right? Um, and what it meant to show up. I think about people with disabilities who have to travel. And I feel like I'm framing this in a very deficit way and I'm not meaning to do that. I'm saying places are different. And we wanna be thoughtful about going into other people's spaces. In my family, if we bring somebody over, we have to remind them, you're a guest. We are guests when we enter other people's countries. We are grateful for their hospitality, and we're, not, um, we're also not confused by what experiences we might have. There are biases in this country, 
that traveled beyond this land, okay? And so one of those biases or stereotypes, and some people have found what they consider evidence to say that, again, we're loud and wrong. Sometimes we don't have to know what's happening in the rest of the world. I invite you, before you leave, if you're not already, to tune into news that is not coming from this country. Not because it doesn't matter, but because you hear a different understanding of how things are shaped. Um, our country is still a superpower um, for right now, however you define that, in terms of military, yup. Um, the influence of what leaves the shore, right? What goes forward and how that shapes. And so one of my colleagues did research, um, one of my homegirls I do research with, she's not a colleague here, uh, did research on grad students of color who traveled abroad and what their experiences were. Anti-blackness travels, <laughs> homophobia travels, ableism travels, concepts of class travel, and it shifts, right? ideas shift. So you all are college students, but some people might think y'all are rich just because you're from here. The question is not why would they think that, the question is why might they think that, right? Um, why might? So Dan was talking about he loves bartering. Bartering stresses me out. Baby, how much does it cost? I can pay you or I can't. Um, I just buy. And so when I was in Ghana, I realized culturally I'm not accustomed to having to barter. I don't like it. I either have the money or I don't. Right? I just please, please do not make me barter. Um, and sometimes that meant I paid a higher price. Luckily, I had five extra dollars. It all works out. So all that to say is, I love that y'all are going abroad. It makes me extremely happy. I was, I've been very sad that folks have not been able to travel. Go with an open mind. Invite yourself to wonder, not to judgment. There are plenty of things we can critique. That's the easy part, right? But when you're in someone else's home, you are a guest and you are thoughtful, right? What does this mean? And, and what you know here goes with you. When you come back, Time can shift. Time in Ghana and in South Africa were different concepts. There was not a consequence for time in Ghana, particularly in Ghana, South Africa somewhat. There was not a consequence for time in a way that was jolting when I came back stateside. Time is a different concept in some places. Figure out what's a different concept. How is it different? How might that impact what happens here? What can you learn in your time away beyond what's in class, and how does that inform how you move when you come back? Um, think about how would you learn about culture and place and time impact the work that you're doing. If you're studying economics, if you're studying a language, how does what you learn about yourself and the history of a place, history is plural, of a place, how does that impact what you might learn about your craft, right? So I feel like I sat up here and did a whole lot of like auntie talking, and that's fine too, that's fine, but I'm excited for y'all. I just want y'all to go with open minds and move to wonder, not judgment. Move to curiosity. Move to, yes, learn what you go there to learn and consider what else you might learn and what are the implications of that. Right? How, what might that mean? And what are some similarities? Or um, how might those practices show up in this culture, all the cultures that make up the US culture? How might those show up here and we just call them something different? Or we talk about it in a different way, right? I'm single. Yeah, I ain't never been married and I don't have no kids. I love kids, but they're not for me in my life. I just don't. When I have to travel abroad and tell people I'm almost 40 and I don't have kids, it's a whole ordeal. And it's a whole ordeal when I go to church at my auntie and uncle's church that I'm grown and don't have kids, right? So these concepts are not brand new. How they're talked about and thought of look very different. Might be different. So I'm done with my talking. Let me make sure I hit any points. Um, questions, conversations. I have some things written out, but not all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, questions. Things that said, hmm, that makes sense. Lessons learned. I'm gonna put my mask back on so I can travel, so we can take the mic with us. Yes.
I remember once in high school being told that if you're ever studying abroad, to tell people you're from Canada and not America. Fascinating. So I don't know, is that, what is your opinion on that? Um, I'm sure the devil ain't gonna make me no liar. So I'm not lying about where I'm from. I, I'm not. One, our accents tell us. People sometimes uh, don't know where I'm from. You know, they know I'm from America. Typically, one, someone's already announced it, right? These are our students from the University of Georgia. These are our students from, you know, Rutgers University. And so there's no real hiding it, right? Sometimes people will say, oh, tell them you're from here. The question is, right, why would they tell you to say that, right? Because they don't want folks to know they, that you're American. I've heard other Americans say stuff like, people are gonna charge you more money if you tell them that you're from America. Well, Canada's not a broke country either. They still gonna charge you more money, right? It's just like a Western country. And so I think what people are trying to say misguidedly is you may be unsafe if you're American, right? Uh, there are some interesting realities sometimes that accompany our presence in other spaces, given the histories of our countries gallivanting across the globe, right? And so you wanna be aware of what those things are, but I'm not gonna tell you to lie um, I'm not gonna tell you to, you know, tell people that you're from somewhere that you're not. And I would be interested if you ever talk to this person again, ask them why they would tell you that and see what they're coming from you on that with. But usually someone's already told us where we're from. When I was just out at the market, I didn't talk a lot, um, in part because I wanted to listen. And once I started talking, my English would betray me um, in a way that they would then know that I'm American and the end, like all the listening that I could do Thesis, right? One, I don't know what you're saying. I can't speak any language that's not English. Um, but once folks know that you are American, sometimes they're like, why are you here? Or like, that's interesting. And then I don't want that that's interesting. I want to know just like what I can hear. I want to learn from people, um, things like that. Yeah, thank you for offering that. Other observations, questions, all right, I see one here. Now, yeah, you can go ahead and you're on deck next, bringing the mic to you after this person's done. Go ahead. So uh, how did studying abroad, or in what way did it benefit your career? Oh my gosh. Uh, so studying abroad was fun because one, that was the longest flight I'd ever been on. And at that point I was clear, I did not want to live abroad. I, I was clear on that. I, I definitely wanted to travel. Um, I was clear that I needed to get a better handle on, so I, let me back up, pause, call yourself down. I studied higher education, how our structures are pulled together. And I was pretty clear after studying that the U.S. model for higher education was a more um, universe, was more uh, global standard than I actually knew was a thing, particularly in how we provide care for students. Um, so um, thinking about mental health, um, advocating for uh, additional care, ongoing care, things like that. I saw that it was present in South Africa, was present in some more places, got to meet with some vice presidents and deans. And all that was great. So for me, then going into um, the U.S.'s higher ed student affairs sort of culture, had colleagues back on the continent. So when we had our international conferences, I knew people. And I had a bigger range of experience to speak from, right? So I understood we had fraternity and sorority life. And for, their, for, for them, their residence halls function in those space-making, fraternal, sororal sort of places. So I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta, right? Ooh, ooh go, can go. Well, they had a residence hall on their campus that was red with elephants. And I was like, well, this is cute. So that was the way that it shaped my learning. But then I also understood that the world around me is much bigger than I thought. And I really need to get a handle on understanding before I go making assumptions what people are asking me, what it is that they might want to know, and what orientation it is that they're coming from. And also very clear then, too, that just because we export a lot of news doesn't mean that things translate. And so I need to take some thoughtfulness around when someone from who, who is not from the U.S. is engaging me, trying to understand what they believe to be true, and then trying to meet them where they are to say, yeah, here's some back-end information, and so here's how these things kind of work out, right? So super helpful around that, yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask you something to the first question yeah. that you kind of gave a response to. 
Um, so I'm Asian American, and then at a young age, I've been often asked, like, where are you from? And then I'll tell them the U.S., and then yeah. they're like, but where are you actually from? And I'll be like, Virginia. And they're like, well, no, where, where, you're actually, where you're actually actually from? And they're like, oh, so you're asking about my parents? So I was wondering, um, when, you're, when you did your study abroad, was there something like a similar situation where oh, they found out, oh, you're American? Or what is like the most like popular question first time meeting you is lots of or, like a common question they will ask you all the time. Um, let me grab the mic so I can get more Thank you. Uh, the question is what was the most common question? One was um so Beyonce was not Beyonce then. Beyonce was a member of Destiny Child. So I just want to provide some context for Tom. So people wanted to know like, do you know Destiny Child? Um, do you know, you know, insert famous person I'm like, no, no I don't. Um, I was not asked where I was from um, because, the, well, there were, um, these hips don't lie. So people wanted to know what country I was from and I was like, now if I start talking, they are gonna know I'm not from here and I'm gonna tell them myself. Um, so sometimes people would ask, well, where are your ancestors from? Is what I would get sometimes. Like, oh, you're black American, so where are your ancestors from? And I'm like, mm, I didn't do ancestry. There was no ancestry in 2007. Um, so I, ha I had no idea. I just knew probably from the West Coast of Africa. So I mean, sometimes it's like pop culture stuff, right? So right now, like, do you know Beyonce? Why would we know Beyonce? So sometimes I would lie, right? I was at the guy and was like, do you know Beyonce? I was like, yes, we're cousins. Um, or <laughs> I'm not telling y'all to be liars, but baby, I love a good time, okay? Um, uh, or folks will ask like, oh, like, what what have a stereotype folks understand from TV or music is what comes up. <clears throat> so there, um, our music here is interesting. And so sometimes people, there were two times when people greeted me with the N word because they'd heard it in music. Like, oh, come on, I'm like, whoa, follow the brakes, back up. And so you get popular culture questions, right? Oh, is everybody rich? Does everybody have a mansion? And I'm like, boo, I still don't own a house. Um, and so trying to explain class in this country is really hard sometimes. Like, we're not all rich. Like, Mark Zuckerberg is like rich, rich, rich. We all have to go to work. Like, <laughs> I have to work. So it, it's interesting, but it's the popular culture stuff that I get. I, I would be interested in folks of color who travel, what their experiences are. Not that people who are coded as white don't get those questions, um, but where are you from? Yeah. <laughs> Was there another question? Yes. I think we have maybe time for one more. I don't want to run up y'all's schedule. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, my, um, that's my great nephew's name. Oh, you. nice. It's a very strong name. Yes, it is. Um, first off, I just want to say I'm obsessed with you. <laughs> I love uh, your speech. And um, I just also wanted to ask, like, when people did uh, like express like microaggressions and like blatant racism or racism that we would consider racism in this country. Yeah, we would consider yeah. it. Right, yeah. Did uh, right. you ever like just like put them in their place or like was there ever a time where you said like I can't like just uh, like accept this and you said um, something? That's a really great question. Um, if, if, if there's another hand that wants to go up, go ahead and go up and I'll come back. Um, what do you do when there's a microaggression? I live in microaggressions. <laughs> Um, either it's body size. I got a lot of stuff because I'm a fat girl. I'm unapologetically fat. I'm a critical fat studies person. Um, I'm not apologizing about these hips when it comes to race, skin color, gosh, gender, those microaggressive sort of things, right? Let's go through strategies real quick and I think we can actually close up there. When something happens, and I want the when to set in, when, not if, when, okay? When the communist says, when the thing happens, what do you do? It depends. If it's a safety issue, right, I'm quiet. I'm not going to argue back with you. When someone says something about my butt out in public, my homeboy happened to be with me, I wasn't going to be like, that's sexist, stop it. Probably would have cost me my physical safety. Aggressive, not even micro. I'm going to stand there, I'm going to be quiet, I'm going to find a way to distance myself, right? I'm going to try to interrupt that space. Um, uh, we were with someone and he said something like, my ancestors were smart enough to run. That's the intercommunal, interdiasporic dig around black Americans being the people who weren't smart enough to leave and we got caught, right? 
We were able to address that through our faculty member because he was older than us and that was considered disrespectful to directly confront him about that comment. We told our faculty member and she had a good talk with him around that, right? So when it happens, you're figuring out, is it safe for me to say something or do something? And I don't even know that I have to say something, I'm gonna mark it down. And if it creates a safety issue, whoever's your faculty lead, let them know. I'm a fan of telling your faculty leads. That's why they're there. I don't know what y'all told them, but I told them something else. Tell your faculty lead. If the faculty lead doesn't know what to do, we will figure that out, right? Ex anticipate some discomfort. If it's a safety issue, flag it. If it's discomfort, note it. Anticipate um, there being like stuff that happens. It's like, oh, was that a microaggression? Oh, oh. Know that microaggression is not a global term. People are like, oh, micro what? <laughs> okay. However you deal with microaggressions here, try those strategies there. Okay. If you ever feel unsafe, please tell the grown up. Not that y'all are not adults, but there are people who are there to shepherd the experience. Please tell them. And then we can better equip them to support you while you're away. If you travel with a group, which you probably will, be each other's keeper, please. Hold space for each other. Okay? Hold space. Stuff, people are gonna go through stuff, they're gonna experience, they're gonna process in real time. You don't have to have the answer. The best answer might be, I can't help you, but I can hold space with you. And I invite you to journal. I invite you to process when you get back. Make sense of it, dig into it. What does that do? How does that feel? And what are the implications of that? I'm done with my time, Dan. Woo. Don't start today, Dan, come on back up here. <laughs>